All right, welcome everybody. I'm very excited today to have Dr. Becky Kennedy with us, who is one of our headlining speakers at our conference this April. Dr. Becky Kennedy is, well, everyone knows her from Good Inside, which has just taken off with the pot in the podcast world. So that must be so exciting for you. And uh, she's also known as the Millennial Parenting Whisperer for Times Magazine. She's a clinical psychologist, and she is also a mom of three. So she knows her parenting business, not only as a professional, but uh, like you walk the walk when you've got three kids at home. Yeah. Definitely. I don't know if I'm walking the walk, but I am like, I'm trying to walk the walk at home. That's what treading I Treading water, say. walking, I don't know, a little bit of- Walking, comedy. treading. Exactly. <laughs> Alternating between the two. Absolutely. So- uh, Dr. Becky is going to be talking about deeply feeling kids. And so I think we just want viewers um, who are thinking about coming to our conference to hear about, you know, a little bit more about what this topic is about. So can you speak to that? Yeah. So I'm really, really excited uh, to share some of these ideas with a clinical community. And one of, I think, the important things to think about with deeply feeling kids are the way that these kids are prone, I think, later in life to a lot of borderline pathology or kind of tendencies. And one of the things I really focused on in the parenting world is understanding these kids and understanding what they really need early on to develop a sense of feeling at home in themselves, feeling safe in the world. And the way I would describe deeply feeling kids are that they're kids who experience their emotions really intensely and worry, essentially, that their big feelings that overwhelm them will overwhelm and push their caregivers away. And so when they're feeling vulnerable in that way, deeply feeling kids are super conflicted about taking in the support and help they actually need because they so desperately want connection in the same moments they so intensely fear rejection and abandonment. So deeply feeling kids enter into threat mode if they see any signs from caregivers that could be interpreted as confirmation that they're too much or essentially that they internalize that they are bad or unlovable. Okay. So do you, is this similar, dissimilar, like there's some common threads like in our field with like the work of Dr. Elaine Aaron, like with highly sensitive kids? Do Is there a little bit of like crossover there with, with that piece, do you think? Is I that think that there's, now? I think there's definitely overlap there. And okay. so many people in my community say uh, the deeply feeling kids workshop so kind of complements, right? Or goes um, that they're like both really, really useful frameworks. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is you've just, you've got kids who have this, like, I'm probably guessing they're not only overwhelmed easily, but they're also highly empathic to other people because if they're so attuned to kind of the, the going ons of other people, um, that I, I guess that they kind of can neglect themselves a little bit too, if they're, they're overly concerned about regulating maybe their caregivers or perceived kind of rejections and, yeah, I actually, I see it slightly differently okay. in that they're so attuned to the messages their caregivers are sending them, not in an attempt to regulate their caregivers necessarily, okay. but because they truly are so fearful, essentially, that the adults around them will confirm their worst fears about themselves, that they are too much, that they are uncontainable, um, that they are in that way then kind of unattachable. Oh, uh, yeah. And you just want so badly to like to work with these kids because they have probably have so much to give with all of that sensitivity and feeling. And you want, I'm sure they've got just this capacity to give so much to the world. So you want so badly to connect with them. And 100%. Yeah, and like wield that, but in like for the positive rather than like you said, going down that borderline-ish route, yes. <laughs> so to speak, those tendencies. Yes. Okay, awesome. So if you, if you know, there's parents watching and they're they're saying, oh my gosh, that's my kid, that's oh, it's all of my kids. What is maybe, I know we're going to talk so much more about this at the conference, but like what is one strategy that you could offer today to be like, here's one thing you could do to help a kiddo who's drowning in this? Yes. So I think I'll kind of 
talk about two things in terms of instead of this, do this. Because I think one of the kind of strategies we call on a lot with our kids and we hear a lot about in the parenting world is some version of name the feeling. That like talking to kids about how they feel in the moment is validating and helps them calm down. So saying to a kid, you're so mad, you're so mad, I know you're mad, does actually help some kids. Or you're so sad to kind of name the feeling. That actually, I don't have any problem with that approach and that is helpful to a lot of kids, but usually that actually escalates things for deeply feeling kids. And I have so many parents who say to me, oh my goodness, for so many years I thought I was doing it wrong, right? And I've seen the difference with my own kids. That's so helpful with two of my kids. The other one, forget it, because deeply feeling kids, they they feel intruded on. Mm. They honestly, it's intrusive to have those vulnerable experiences named so directly. Those kids, instead of kind of naming the feeling, they actually respond really well to naming the magnitude of the feeling. And I'll model the difference. Instead of, you know, what what would happen in my house, right? Oh, no, I cut my kids' grilled cheese in half in triangles instead of, you know, two rectangles. That could be, you know, that could be a really That's disaster. That's a meltdown. That's a meltdown. A meltdown, you know? Yeah. So instead of, oh, you're so disappointed, right? Naming the magnitude or describing the magnitude would look like this. This doesn't just feel bad. This is like this bad. Wait, this bad. And then usually a kid will say, it's this. And you can, yes, it's this bad. Or this isn't as bad as like the apartment. This bad is as big as the apartment building, isn't it? Or actually all of New York City. And what I find that really does for kids, and especially deeply feeling kids, is it helps them feel believed in how intense the feeling is. Because it's not just the type of feeling that actually feels bad. It's that deep, deep, intense feeling. And when you name the magnitude and you focus on the magnitude instead of focusing on just the name, that really, really connects for them. And they usually will be able to take that in. Yeah, it's very visceral, like the way you're, you're doing it. So I wonder if that really connects with that brainstem, that body, like that, that part of the brain that's really dysregulated is we're going from more of a bottom. Is it a limbic? We're getting right down to like what's going on, like their interception of like their body sensations. That's what it sounds like to me. So I am an EMDR therapist and looking at like all of this stuff, like this makes sense to me. From I think that that's exactly right. And I also think... You know, I always think about for me, if I came home and I had some like horrible day and I, you know, lost my wallet and I found out my friends didn't invite me to something they were all doing and I then spilled something all over my favorite shirt. If my husband said to me, you're upset, I'd I'd be like, no, like, it's not that I'm upset. It's that it was the worst day ever, right? Like, it almost would feel invalidating to just name the feeling. And so I think that helps. But also, related to what you're saying, feelings are so nebulous, and especially if feeling scare kids, which they do for all kids because they're so powerful, but definitely deeply feeling kids, putting a feeling into something concrete, like a size, I think a kid essentially is like, oh, I, yeah, I get that. Like, I, that's right. That is something I can connect to. And that's very trauma, like if we look at like trauma-informed care, when we like look at scaling with kids, like when we do trauma work, we don't just name the feeling either. It's like when when they feel something in their body, we're like, can you show me how big, is it big as the room? Is it big as this desk? Is it big as your hand? Like it is very visceral. We don't just say, oh, you were, you were scared when that horrible thing happens. You like, that doesn't speak to the overwhelm and disconnect that they feel. So, I mean, so this to me is like lots of good, you could use this for trauma informed work for any parents listening who have kids who've experienced a lot of trauma and their bodies overwhelm them very easily. Um, This would just be gold and stuff. So as a fellow trauma informed therapist, I really appreciate that approach. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we're so excited to have you. Thank you for taking the time today. And I I think you're going to be such an asset to to the conference and best of luck with your podcast. It's so exciting. So it's neat because I, when we were all going through the, uh, the beginning of COVID, we, we followed your posts. Like when you just first started doing the blue and the blue and yellow and the white posts. And it's so neat to see the evolution because I've looked at your stuff from day one. So it's really like, so just wanted to put that out there. It's just so cool to see. Thank you. It's such an honor to be part of such an important conference. So really thank you for, for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Becky.